says it's recording, I will take that at its word and we will just, we can just jump right into it. So let's see. So this is, this is going to be episode 21 of the Flatiron Syndicate Motorsports Podcast. And we have got with us today a couple of special guests. So people that you, that if people have been watching, you guys have not met before. So as a, as a starting point, uh, Clint and Micah, let's just uh, kind of introduce yourselves and kind of tell us, uh, you know, where people could, could find you or might have heard about you or what you guys do. And, and we'll go from there. Micah, you want to start? Sure. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, Micah McMahon, uh, owner of 3MI Racing. Uh, I don't know. Uh, specialized in making angry Subarus for a while. Got off in the race car industry for a while. Back to running 3MI full time. Nice. And uh, making fun little bits and pieces and consulting. So, well, and Mike, I just real quick too, like you've you've been part of the Subaru community for a good a good amount of time. <laughs> Long time. Um, <laughs> there's there's probably a pretty good chance, like if people have been on NASIOC at any point, uh, might well have seen you posting there and and going, geez, homemade would WRX. Be, yeah, that was my yeah. username. Yeah. Would it be fair to say 15 years? Is that Oh, more than probably that. more than that now more yeah that? i think okay. I, did, I did my wx swap i think back in 03 wow so okay yeah. just a little while a little while just a little while yeah yeah oh, that, yes. i blame wrc yes so. <laughs> it, it, it got a lot of us that way well and clint uh where where uh might people have heard about you or, or what the company that you work for okay uh my name is clint bogus i am one of the owners of turn in concepts uh Find us at turningconcepts.com. Mm -hmm. uh, myself and Tony Barber, who is in the office next to me, uh, we have been doing this since uh, since early 2005. Wow, uh, is when we started Turning Concepts, and uh, it's just gone from there. Yeah, well, that's awesome. Well, and and the topic that we wanted to talk about today is kind of specific, but I I wanted to just kind of. Give, give people a little bit of an idea of how this came up. I, basically what it, what it was, uh, we were looking for a set of rods and Clint, I was thinking, well, maybe, you know, you guys build engines, you have an engine program. Mm -hmm. Maybe you guys would have a set of these lodge rods lying around that or at the time we're on back order. And you made this comment, which is, I can't remember the last time I built an engine with a stock length rod. Yes, that is true. And, and that, and I had realized that. And one of the things, like when we were putting your, the, the turning concept sharp locks on our website, mm -hmm. most of them are using a longer rod. Yes. And but was when you, when you said that, it just kind of clicked to me, like, wait a minute, like you really are not even using a stock length rod. So there must be a reason behind it. Yeah. And the answer is there's, there's probably a lot of reason and rationale, but there's a lot of, I think that there's a lot of details to why you would use a longer rod in building an engine that maybe are just not as well understand or, or not as not and there's not as much information out there because this is something that I think it would be fair to say is not hugely common out there because a lot of engines maybe don't have the benefit for extending the the rod length that the Subaru engine does or or maybe another way to put it is it's not as easy to do it in other engines as it is in a Subaru engine? Correct. Um, I think it's a lot of, uh, I'll, I'll actually go and say, I, I blame a lot of the talk going back to the initial quote unquote D stroker. Okay. Um, so it started literally with Dominic Acia, uh, get a mm -hmm. Dom tune. He's I think at tier one now, did a long yep. stint where they did a lot of D strokers at uh, Maxwell propulsion, well, Maxwell power. Yep. Um, and a lot of the chat started where it, we started getting into what was plus twos and plus fours. That being plus two millimeter longer rod plus four millimeter longer rod. Okay. So it literally started <laughs> over dinner in the kitchen with Dom. Uh, this is back at circa 2005 or something. That's and, fantastic. Uh, and uh, started talking about de-stroking an EJ25, or in other words, really all we were doing was doing a big bore EJ20. Sure. So we looked at it that way. What we wanted to do is have the nice smooth revs on EJ207 with you know, some extra displacement. Um, I went down the rabbit hole doing all the engineering nerd numbers. And of course I started punching out the bore so that I have essentially the same displacement as the two five, but all the rest okay. of the two Oh seven. Um, and so the nomenclature became plus two plus four and you could put sure. a plus two on a 79 mil stroke. You can fit okay. a plus four only in the 75 and kind of the golden rule where it started was pushing the compression height 
to 28.7 millimeters. Okay. And even compression height is kind of misnomer. Piston height. Um, and that's essentially, you know, at the top of the crown to where the pin sits, center pin. So you have that right. given height. Um, and I kind of stopped there when I did the initial plus 4D stroker because it was known territory because 83 mil strokers were running the same compression height. Yep. And uh, perk being if they're on a short skirt, we have even less, you know, skirt load compared to them because we have less rod angle. So it'll definitely be safe. And that's just kind of stuck and made it very modular. Gotcha. So let's, let's start with some, some basic background. First yes. Back. You know, um, way back in the day, uh, you know, 2001, late 2000s, we found out we were going to get the WRX here in the States. Uh, and, and Subaru had had a, a following, a, a, a grassroots cult-like following uh, with the 2.5 RS for years. Sure. Huge enthusiasm for the WRX. Coming over, two liter motor, hey, this is going to be great, turbocharged, all the fun, Jap Japan doesn't get the cool cars anymore, now we get one. And, right. and you're looking at that EJ motor, uh, and, and it has the stock stroke for that setup was 75 millimeters. Mm -hmm. And then uh, along comes uh, late 2002 into 2003, and oh, look at this, they're going to bring the STI, all sorts of excitement. Uh, and if you were around back then, you, you remember all of the speculation that was going on that, oh, are we going to get the 207? Are we going to get a different uh, 205? What's going to happen? So on and so forth. And everybody was completely and utterly floored, just out of the blue. Oh my gosh, we're getting a 2.5 liter engine. This is unheard of, completely new, blew everyone away. Big surprise, a lot of excitement about that. And how they did that is they opened up the bore and they increased the stroke to 79 millimeters. So now you have two common strokes for the EJ engine. You have the 75 millimeter crank and you have the 79 millimeter crank. Following along with that, aftermarket starts to pick up. People are modifying these. They're making more power. Let's go back to the old days of you want to make more power. Let's make some more torque. How do we make more torque? Real easy way to do it. Increase the stroke. Sure. So now you're talking about stroker cranks that are out there. Instead of your standard 75 millimeter or your 79 millimeter, you're talking about 81 millimeter. I think it was Cosworth that didn't. Cosworth was 81, yeah. Uh, and then uh, you had guys like Manley that came out with an 83 millimeter stroke. So you're adding two millimeters of stroke. You're adding four millimeters of stroke uh, to these motors and you're getting more torque and making more power but you're keeping the same length rod. Uh, and this was really a good setup from a historical standpoint. Now, Micah can step in here because I was not involved in the development at, at this time of D-strokers or long rods or things like that. But now you have a four millimeter longer stroke with the same length rod. You've got to move something. Otherwise, it, that piston's going to come up and it's going to smash into the head and you're going to have a really, really bad day. And it's worth uh, mentioning that the way that they were using the stock length rod is they were moving the wrist pin location up. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. Exactly. So they were moving the wrist pin up two millimeters yeah. on an 83 millimeter stroke. Now, a lot of people out there, they're going to be like, wait, Clint, you're talking about four millimeters of stroke change and only two millimeters of wrist pin change. The top Keep in mind, we're talking, about a, we're talking about a <laughs> Yes. So cut that in half. There's your two millimeters. Move the wrist pin two millimeters. Bing, bang, boom. Yep. Bob's your uncle. Away you go. Making a lot of power. A lot of good engines. Uh, back when we started doing time attack, uh, the, the big power teams, the guys we were watching, they were running around 83 millimeter stroke. Uh, or they're running around with an 81 millimeter stroke. And, and we're talking like 2.7 liters or 2.63, I think it was, Mike. Uh, for what? For 81 versus uh, uh, 83 millimeter stroke. Uh, I've actually got it right here. Either um, way, these, are, these were teams that are making big power. And, yeah. and, you know, at this point in time, you're thinking like tractor engine, truck engine, Chevy, you know, you know yeah. a lot of stroke. Uh, yeah. it, the Evos. Well, I mean, one of the early ones was, was Brian Crower pushing him, too, because of where yeah. he, he okay, comes yeah. from the domestic world, you know, his dad. So strokers are the thing. And he did 83s way back. Actually, one of the first strokers I did was a Brian Crower kit. Okay. So, but yeah, it's, it's uh, 2.58 liters, given 2 the same board. 2.6, roughly. 
round it up. So, so you know, you've got these guys in there, and they're they're making great power, but the concern was about revs and and gearing limited. Like you had the STI transmission, the, the six B transmission, which is a tank of a transmission, but very close gearing, uh, and not set up for a top speed. On a short track, a lot of turns, great setup. But a longer track or big sweepers, High you're running speed. out of gear. So you, you want more revs. Difficult to do with a stroker motor just because of the stress that we put on it. Um, now, hey, some, Clint, just real quick, Mike, or, or could you maybe just talk about where, what some of those stresses would be, what, what you would look out for? Well, some of the issues you have, uh, certain strokers, depending on the rod, you have to start clearancing down around the mains. So you're actually cutting into the block to make room for the throw. Um, some of the other stresses you'll see come from so for the same given RPM, uh, the stroker will have a higher mean piston speed, which is essentially the average speed it sees. Yeah. On top of that, you'll have higher peak accelerations. You'll have higher velocities, uh, you know, peak velocities that it is. So as the piston moves up and down, and well, we can get into rod ratios and it's easier with graphics. But um, essentially, you're, you're yanking it harder uh, from basically away from top dead center because the real trade-off is uh, it's easier to think if you have 79 in the middle, 75 mil stroke yeah. here. 83 to the other side is the 83 will spend more time near bottom dead center. The, the 75 will spend more time near top dead center. And so what happens is this starts slinging away from top dead center really hard as you get to the longer stroke, the shorter stroke is a little bit easier. Um, okay. And so, yeah, you, you're the more pistons sway, the heavier things get, the more G's you're putting on it and you're just, you know, beating up bearings and everything else. You're changing, changing the stress load on the rotating assembly. Correct. Okay. One of the other things that is a stressor that comes up, and this is where you get really nerdy, uh, <laughs> Clint can cool. attest to breaking cranks. We've been there, done that. Is the other thing you have is you change the stroke. Is you have your main bearing and then you have your rod bearing, and as you change the stroke, you have less overlap, and the crank becomes more fragile. So okay. the overlap between your different journals becomes a failure point as you reduce it. Because you, it, essentially, it, you're you're relying upon that section of counterweight to be strong enough to take those stresses. Because sure. you don't have the pin for the rod overlapping with the pin for the mains as much. Correct. Uh, would be the way to put it. So to keep going into the history, um, you know, we, we started doing uh, time attack and racing and, and uh, you know, it's tough on engines. Uh, and, and you break a lot of them. Uh, you learn a lot of things, but you break a lot of them. And, and mm -hmm. we, we broke our fair share plus some uh, uh, doing, doing this stuff. And, uh, uh, Micah got involved with us in our race program from an engine standpoint. Um, and, uh, we started talking about long rod motors and de-stroked motors and carrying more RPMs and stress on the inter internal components, uh, and all that stuff. So that's when, when Micah, uh, became involved with our race program. Uh, and, he explained to me the, the concepts of a long rod motor. And, and when we're talking a long rod, I, I, I want to be very clear. We're not talking huge amounts. Right. Well, we're talking two millimeters or four millimeters. Uh, beyond that, it starts to become major packaging concerns. Um, but the way that Micah explained it to me was, was a few ways. Uh, number one, it slows things down a little bit just calms things down, uh, which, is, which is great for a super. Uh, and Dom could, Dom could talk about this all day long. Um, and the other thing is uh, side load. You know, you already have an engine that has a very short skirt on a piston. And, and so there's not a lot of area to spread that stress over. And with the greater side load of a stroker engine or even stock engine, uh, compared to a long rod engine, you have a lot more forces pushing to the side, creating more friction, just putting all that extra stress on, on a pretty critical component of, of your engine. Uh, you know, it's the piston. Yeah. It's, uh, it's real critical. quick, real quick. If anybody wants to look at this, look up what is called a crank slider model. And essentially the longer the stroke for the same rod, literally the more angle you have on the rod, which is the yeah. force on the skirt. And as you lengthen the rod, it lessens that angle. Likewise, if you shorten the stroke, it brings it back in. So, 
I'll see if I can find an, an image or Mike, if you've got yeah. any images, you can send it yeah. to me and I'll try and I'll put it up there once, once we put this video out so people okay. can see it. But it's, I mean, basically you're thinking about a triangle. Yes. I mean, you know, the, 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 the wrist pin is the top, the, the, the skirt, it would be one side of it. And then basically the angle back and, and you're just, you're controlling the angle of that, of that force as the, as the rod goes through its rotation. Exactly. Exactly. So as part of all of this, Micah had uh, developed his, his own rotating assembly. Um, it was a plus two millimeter setup using a, an absolutely wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, rod, plus two millimeter rod and a custom piston. Uh, the custom piston was by JE. The rods were by, I think it was Sains. Sains, yeah, it's Sains. Um, and it was a 300M rod, really nice material, uh, L19 ARP rod bolts. Uh, it was set up for lightweight, a lot of revs, very quick response out of the engine. So you're talking uh, about the honey badgers. I am talking about the yeah, honey Yeah, there you okay. go. <laughs> and I bought, uh, I bought 10 of these rotating assemblies. Um, and we built some of these motors and they ran amazingly well. Uh, in fact, I, I built one of those motors for my own car, my own personal car. Mm -hmm. And we beat that thing like it owed us money, a lot of money. We mm -hmm. beat the snot out of it. Stoplight racing, not a problem. Interstate highway poles, sure. Oh, track day this weekend, sure. We'll do that, autocross the next, why not? Let's go just beat the snot out. We beat the snot out of that motor for 60,000 miles. Wow. Just beat it up. And it took every bit of it. And we had it set up to rev to about 8,500 RPM. And it hit that every time I drove it. Wow. Every time I drove it. And, and it was a daily driver for a long time with that setup too. Um, so that was really the, the, the start of turning concepts doing a long rod motor. Okay. Uh, and then uh, Dom Asia, uh, you know, he, he was running uh, with Craig Woolman. He was running uh, Maxwell Power MPS uh, up, in, uh, up in the Northeast mm -hmm. and decided he'd had enough. And they, they, they shut down MPS. And Dom actually came to work out here at Turning Concepts for a while. Uh, and one of the things he did, he, he tuned, but he also revamped the engine program. Uh, at the time, we were offering your standard stage one drop-in piston, your stage two pistons and rods, uh, and then the super, super special Honey Badger setup, which was Micah's lightweight rotating assembly. Um, and Dom had developed with Manly a, a plus two millimeter H-beam rod okay. uh, for about the same price as your normal off-the-shelf Manly turbo tub. Uh, and he had an entire matrix of pistons to work with this to get this compression ratio. And if you're after this, and if you're running these heads with this combustion chamber volume, you do this and that and the other. So he had a very nice mix and match. And, and we were able to whittle that down uh, to a standardized offer. Uh, at the time, we called it the honey badger, mm -hmm. keeping with the whole badger theme. Yeah. Um, and it was, a, uh, it was a plus two millimeter rod with a JE piston. Uh, 79 millimeter crank in a new EJ257 case. Wasn't that the beefy uh, badger or something like that? Yeah, we called it the beefy badger. Oh, yeah. um, because it was beefier than, than the honey badger. Honey badger was lightweight, very responsive. Your beefy badger okay. was your run of the mill. It'll take whatever you throw at it and it'll keep asking for more setup. Great setup. I really like that motor. Still a number of them out there running around. Um, and, and, just, and, as a, uh, just as a quick footnote, so this is a 2.5 liter engine we're talking about. It's yes, this is yeah. a 2.5 liter, so it's a 99.5 millimeter or 99.75 millimeter bore, uh, 79 millimeter stroke, 2.5 liter engine. Okay. Uh, and uh, you know, we would, with some oversight from Dom uh, in his experience in building these, because he was building them back at MPS, as a matter of fact, all of the beefy badger rods were still branded as MPS rods. Uh, and I believe they still are. Um, okay. But, uh, you know, we would build them here. Uh, he would give us insight into uh, the assembly of these short blocks or of these engines based on his experience. And, uh, and then he would tune them. And they worked great. They worked amazingly well. Uh, to the point that we didn't see 
the point of offering a, a standard stage two normal length rod build anymore. Uh, for the very simple reason of price was about equivalent. It mm -hmm. tuned nicer. It wasn't as much stress on the components of the engine. So you got something that lasted longer. Uh, and our customers were very, very happy with the build. So we killed off anything that was a stock length rod, unless it was something that you wanted to custom build, which okay. there were a few of them, the uh, autocross guys, you know, they're very picky about the rule set that for their right. class. So we would follow that. Um, but a majority of our engines at that point in time were the BP Badger setup. It was a very nice balance between capabilities, power, and price. Uh, and then uh, Dom moved back, back east, and and we continued west. to build. <laughs> hmm? the, the other east, he moved west. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're right. Dom, Dom moved back, back west. Back so to I Washington, guess, yeah. Back okay. to Washington. So I guess uh, when I said northeast earlier, I'm sorry, northwest. I can't tell my left from my right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> quite all right it, it's a big sphere you you, you just keep going yeah, in one direction. you, you just keep back. going yeah. you'll get there eventually yeah. good call yeah. <laughs> so anyway so i moved back home back home uh basically and we continued with the uh philosophy of the long rod motor um and we had done a few d strokers uh with okay. a plus two millimeter rod um and i think we've done a one or two plus fours i, I don't remember um Actually, we have one in the works right now for my comics car uh, as a okay. plus four setup. Um, but uh, we have continued with that. We've been very successful with it. Uh, we've made a few small changes, but it's still very much the basics of what Dom has taught us uh, over time. Where we have continued to improve is our assembly process, uh, our, how close we pay attention to tolerances. Um, I. I, I'll, I'll, con I'll be the first to admit, I have not built a short block myself in years. I used to be the guy that, sure. that before Dom, I was the guy that assembled all of them. Uh, and then it was Dom for a bit. And then uh, one of my guys that I have here, a uh, fellow by the name of Ethan, uh, started taking that over and sat down with Dom and went through a lot of the training, sat down with me, went through a lot of the training, uh, a lot of oversight. Um, and he has, uh, Ethan's been with us for almost seven years now. And I think the past, four, maybe five years, all he has done is engine assembly. Okay. So he has his own little room that's closed off that he keeps nice and clean. It's, it has its own air handling system. It's kept at 68 degrees year round. Mm -hmm. uh, and he does all of our engine assembly. Um, and, uh, and that's the short block. And then once the heads are done, putting the heads on, setting the lash, putting accessories on, and then rolling it out the door for the install. Uh, but majority of the engines that we do, probably 95% are all a plus two millimeter rod. Okay. Right. I'll say that the real thing with doing the plus two is it doesn't make any real huge changes and changes at the well or anything like that. It'll still work well with the given cams that are designed for that engine. Uh -huh. um, really the thing it does, and actually we did the same thing on the EcoBoost uh, for the 4GT is you just lengthen the rod to shorten up compression height, take some weight out of the reciprocating mass. So in other words, you know, the part that's pulsing up and down, mm -hmm. count of percentage of the rod is that included, as opposed to, you know, rotating, which is what's spinning around. So you take some of those stresses out of your crank. Um, and uh, generally done properly, you're lightening your piston a lot too. And so one of the reasons plus two stuck so well is, well, it fits in a 79, but as Clint mentioned, it works for a D-stroker as well right um right. and so dom had actually started stocking them because he found same as i did is i talked more people out of de-stroking ej25 than keeping a 79 mil stroke um and yeah. um you know it's a lower volume so he realized the plus two for him as because he really did it as a business i was still doing it as a hobby at the time you know for me okay. it's someone wanted a cool bespoke project i'm gonna go be a nerd and do some engineering numbers in the evenings when i'm not at my real job sure and uh yeah, for him it worked because then he could buy batches, you know, 25 sets of rods for, you know, all plus two, and it works for a 79 and a 75. So, but it works, it's, it's more of a refinement. It's not a world-changing thing, and if it costs you nothing else, because now Manly and everybody just makes their own plus twos, it's kind of become the standard. Uh, the Callies that I did the FEA stuff for, for you guys, Clint, yep. you know, that's another just standard plus two that's just floating out there now. Um, it's really no added cost, and it's nothing but, you know, benefits, so... And, and worth mentioning, 
just just at this point that to do a 2.5 liter build with that plus two millimeter rod, you do also have to have that special piston. So you have to have the, the rod and the piston. So piston. I, ideally, ideally it would be a, a custom order piston, but the 83 mil stroke pistons have the right compression height. So going back to the spreadsheet, that had been yeah. forementioned, we have some more ones floating around on NASIAC and stuff where it's yeah. like a JE95 83 mil, you know, stroker, Right. Piston 9.5 to 1 compression ratio on a 79 ends up being, I don't know, depending on the heads, you know, mid to upper eights, you okay. know, probably around 8.8 to 9.0, somewhere in that range. Um, okay. And, and a lot of it depends on the heads. Uh, right. we, build, sure. we build a lot of these, uh, you know, they're all based around that STI piston. So if you come to me, for example, with a D25 head, we have to use a little bit thicker head gasket to, to bring that compression ratio down sure. a little bit. And, and the reason for that, a Subaru is, is an engine that it's pretty, no, it's pretty prone to knock. Um, yeah. and, and going too high, you're going to increase that knock. And on a street-driven car that sees all conditions, all different types of fuels, uh, massive temperature swings, being able to control that knock is a good thing. Uh, so sure. just bringing that compression ratio down a little bit really helps for your daily drive. Uh, Especially those hot top mount intercoolers. Yeah, at red yes, lights. absolutely, absolutely. And especially on, on, on a motor, that it, the packaging is pretty tight. Everything gets really hot. If you, if you run out the revs, it gets really, really hot. Uh, so you're, you're worried about thermal management and everything. All of this contributing back to your not control. Um, so that, you know, it has made it just a very nice daily driver setup. And, and we do it just like Michael, we, we talk a lot of people out of a D-stroker, uh, especially if it's a daily driver, because okay. on a daily driver, you're taking off from stoplights, you, you're, you're in traffic, you, you do want that torque. Uh, going to a D-stroker is a great setup if you are running it in an environment where you can keep the revs up and you're not worried about taking off from stoplights much. Um, and these are, these. This is where you start to run into the difference of driving a track motor on the street versus driving a street motor on the track. Okay. Well, and so let's let's maybe kind of define what the D-stroker is or, or kind of what, what the initial idea was for the D-stroker and then kind yeah. of some of the okay. refinements. So, so I'll okay. take this one. Um, so to clarify, when people say long rod, uh, from an engine designer point of view, it's uh, the rule of thumb is a rod ratio. So for those that aren't aware, your rod ratio is the length of your rod divided by your stroke. Okay. Uh, so a long rod technically is a 1.8 to one or longer rod ratio. So the only Subaru rod that I would even consider being a quote technical long rod would be a plus four on okay. a 75 mil crank because it ends up being like 1.79 and change. So we'll just round it to 1.8. Okay. All the rest are still technically short rods. So when we say long rods in the Subaru community, it's literally just meaning a longer than stock connecting rod. Okay, um, sure. And so then again, D-Stroker is, or a, you know, big bore EJ20, they kind of, depends on which way you're looking at it. So I found D-Strokers to someone with an EJ20. It's an easy upsell because they pop their 205 and like, oh, I get 30 port, you know, what, 15% more displacement. Awesome. Right. From a guy going from a Torquey 2.5, getting into a standard bore D-stroker, they're going to lose a lot of that initial grunt. Yeah, they'll have revs later, but again, stoplight traffic that kind of stinks. Um, and then you go the other way, swing further, and you go to the stroker side, which is its own thing where, in my opinion, you're kind of making a tractor motor. Sure. Um, great for guys who have tall gears and autocrossing. You know, it has its niche there. But um, so, well, and, so let's, and let's talk about that. So, so we discussed a stroker motor earlier where you, yep. you take a crank, you put a crank in that has a longer stroke, you have a stroker motor. Now we're doing the opposite. We're de-stroking. So what would be your normal STI 79 millimeter stroke? We're gonna throw a WRX crank in there. 75 millimeters, we've, we've shortened the stroke and de-stroked the motor. Um, and there's a couple ways you can go with that. Uh, it's real easy with a plus two rod. You de-stroke right. it, you put in your plus two rod, you pick your off-the-shelf piston with the with the dish that you want for your compression ratio target. There you go, real easy. Uh, doing a plus four, you've destroked it, and you have to move that wrist pin, just like you are on a seventy-nine millimeter crank, and you have to pay attention 
pay attention to the dish on your piston because you have lowered the compression ratio because you have pulled some stroke off of the crank. And at that point in time, there's, and actually I've been, I've been going through this and I've been in talks with JE about uh, doing a custom piston uh, for us so we don't have to have one set of pistons made at a time. We're going to start doing batches of them, uh, which is you, going You can to, still use the stroker pistons off the it, shelf. It, it, it's too low a compression ratio for my taste. The 9.5 to 1, it drops at the 8.2 to 8.5 range, depending on your heads. There's not a JE off the shelf in the 9.5 with a moved wrist. 83 mil stroker. Yeah, there is. No, there isn't. Give, give me, I tell you what, give me the part number. I was going to say, when do they get rid of it? Because they used to have eight fives and number. Both. I will call Matt because I've been talking to him about doing a custom piston with like an 8cc dish. So you you tell me and we'll go from there. So let's, right. let's just back you, up anyway, just we'll, we'll table that. So, so. Oh, no, just, just to clarify, because we moved through a lot of stuff really fast there. Yeah, sorry. So, so the D stroker <laughs> is putting the two liter crank in the two five case. Yes. Mm -hmm. then, then with the two plus two millimeter rod, the, it, that's the easiest solution because then you can basically pick from the standard STI pistons and then the, yes. the longer rod kind of keeps everything working properly. And well, then the you, plus, it's not the standard STI pistons, the plus two. Hold on. You're saying the D stroker with the plus the two rod? The, the D stroker. Two. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then if you use the custom piston, like for the 83 millimeter stroker engines with a plus four millimeter rod, that's mm -hmm. where you can get as you say, Micah, the true long rod build of a super engine. And right. maybe just clarify what you're talking about there, Clint or, or Micah, as far as needing to increase or, or make a shallower dish on the piston head to get your compression back. Okay. Which, cause that's so, related to the de-stroking. When you take a crank and you yeah. de-stroke it, uh, less stroke. Uh, uh, right. so back Start to with what compression ratio is. Sure. Okay. <laughs> compression ratio, very simple. How much you're squishing stuff? Yep. In so so the, the, the ratio, <laughs> yeah. better than that. All right. The ratio is literally the ratio of piston, you know, displaced volume with the piston at bottom dead center yep. versus at top dead center. So when you say, you know, we'll say an easy number, 10 to one, your volume at bottom dead center is 10 times that of your piston at top dead center. So once yep. you push the piston up and you're all the way up to compression, you know, and it's literally pretty much largely just the dish and now note that's dish and your combustion chamber volume, a little bit from your head gasket height, that sort of thing. Yes. You know, so, how much you squish stuff. Yes, yes, how much you squish stuff. That's the technical terminology. That's yes. the technical term. It, it's easy to understand how much you squish stuff. So when you change your stroke of the crank, it changes how much you squish stuff. Yep. If you go from a 79 millimeter crank to a 75 millimeter crank, you squish less stuff. Your compression ratio has dropped. The volume goes down. And well, so I would you say, you, yeah, your initial volume at bottom dead center is smaller. Yes. So, yeah, the yes. ratio it's then goes less down. Yes, yes. It's all this technical nomenclature. It's all the, all the technical right. nomenclature. Yeah, now yeah. Yeah. You have less stuff to squish, exactly. Yeah. It, it, it's real easy. There's a, there's a whole litany, a, a whole glut of pistons out there on the market that you can mix and match that you can run through a compression ratio calculator to hit a target compression ratio. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not something that I would tell somebody to go out and just do and figure out. You do have to have some base knowledge, like what compression ratios do work well for Subarus, because while it's possible to have a compression ratio that's too high because of the knock tendencies, it's also possible to have a compression ratio that's too low and you've just ruined the efficiency of the engine. I like to shoot for anywhere from 8.2 to 8.5 on my compression ratio. That is where I find things to be happy. If you're running exclusively ethanol, E85, or if you're running a really nice race fuel, or you know, you're gonna do something absolutely crazy like a land speed cart and run methanol, then you can go a little bit more aggressive with the compression ratio, you go a little bit higher. But let's be honest, so most, most of the people out there doing these engines, it's gonna go into either their street car that they're daily driving or a fun weekend car or a track only car. And that's where you've really got to start thinking about the types of, 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 of factors that affect the efficiency of the engine, like compression ratio, 
um, much like you would think about what cams do I choose for my engine if I'm going to choose different cams. So it's more than just pick and match. You've got to know what to pick and what to match, kind of like a recipe and knowing what ingredients work well together to make a complete meal. That, that, is, that is a really interesting point that I think maybe we should like at least hit like hit home or maybe discuss a little bit more. But like if you look at the three different strokes as different choices, you're kind of picking the efficiency range of the engine. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when you're when you're building an issue an, an engine or, or trying to spec out a race spec engine, a lot of the choices you're making have to do or are related to where that engine is going to operate efficiently. Yeah. Stroke is part of that. Cams are part of that. Yep. Turbo is part of that. Yeah. Um, because each of these things like the engine has to be either it has to be efficient when it's spinning slowly, spinning in kind of a mid RPM range or in a high RPM range. And it's really hard to optimize efficiency if you don't have all of those pieces put together to work together properly. Yeah. And, and a good example, and we've, if you've done anything, if you've been in this industry or looked at turbo cars for more than two minutes and tried to figure out what turbo you're going to put on your car, we have all seen the dynographs that look like a mountain, just an absolute right. mountain. Down here, there's absolutely nothing. And all of a sudden, it takes off up top. And you have yep. no area under the curve. And, and a lot of people are like, wow, look at that. It made 700 horsepower. It made 700 horsepower in, in this much of your rev band. Yep. And you have all of this down here where you spend most of your daily driving. And that car would be terrible to drive during, the, you know, during your morning commute or you're going home or on an entrance ramp or anything like that. On your daily driver, you're down here, and all of your power is up here. It, it, it's going to be no fun. And it's going to be terrible to drive. Yeah, because somebody chose a turbo or a configuration that all that that's all that gave. Them. Whereas, if you can come up with a configuration where maybe all the peak isn't up here, maybe maybe bring that down a little bit and spread out your power into a more usable power band, you're going to have a whole lot more fun. So if you're a guy that's daily driving your car and you just want to have some fun on the interstate or taking off from a stoplight. Maybe that longer stroke is more for you. Maybe that smaller turbo is more for you. You're going to have a more pleasant experience overall. Now, if you're building a car that's going to the track, that's going to live all of its life in the, in the upper RPM bands, you know, I'm not taking off from a tree at a drag race. I'm not taking off from a stoplight on the street. I'm spending all of my time in upper RPMs going down the track. Then I'm going to break, enter my turn, feed the throttle in, come out of my turn. Well, and pick up speed down part to keep in mind there is realistically you're coming off the apex. Most guys, unless you're in a long rod with, with you know, right gearing, you're coming off the apex, probably 3,000 RPM, 3,500 RPM. Like you're rolling back into it right at the beginning of what's realistically your torque curve. Either that or you Hopefully. end up being kind of bunched up. Um, you know, if you get something that's too peaky for the given setup. Uh, so yeah. kind of talking in the torque curve realm and the different strokes. None of these strokes is going to make an astronomical change in how your car drives. Right. The biggest difference with people doing a D-stroker is going to be in the displaced volume. Um, so kind of going back to where this started, the first D-stroker I designed was a four-inch bore piston. So it was only 25 cc's smaller than an EJ257. I wanted my cake. I wanted to eat it too. I had the same size displacement with 10,000 RPM revs without any hesitation. Sure. So you, you kind of get to that trade off and yeah, you can make a 79 mil stroke crank spin that high. And if you're making big power, you have to have a billet crank. You will guarantee you're going to snap an OEM crank. They just don't live. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I've done that. I've done that a couple, couple times. A cu couple times. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, they'll do it for a while. They'll be happy. It, if you're building a race engine with a 79 mil OEM stroke, you know, stroke crank, it's a ticking time bomb. It's a maintenance item. It's, it's something that needs inspection. So realistically you buy a billet crank. Yeah. Um, and then, so kind of the pros and cons in building them. Uh, the way I've always looked at it is pistons, rods for, you know, the higher end builds, they're more or less the same cost between doing a, a plus two and a 79 or plus two and a 75 or plus four and a 75 and you know, sure. custom pistons go with it, whatever you want. The big change is then 
You can run an OEM crank in a 75. I've never once seen one fail at all anywhere. You can go billet and get fancy and save some weight, but seeing the latter ones fail, I don't see it. And they have the modified oiling. So the oiling's good for it too. That's, um, that's a key point too. The, the, as long as you get the, the cross drill two liter crank, it, it's, has yeah. different oiling or improved oiling over to the standard 2.5. Yeah, so, so they cross-drilled the 1, 3, and 5 main, so it's actually dual cross-drilled. So it's an X, and instead of being you know straight up a 90, they basically clock it 45 degrees as well. So they've altered okay. the oil timing, but oil timing is a separate discussion for later. Most okay. people who build engines probably don't even know what oil timing is. But well, uh, let's, 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 talk about, let's talk about the oiling on the cranks a little bit. Okay. You know, sure. a, Subaru, a Subaru engine, is it, it has five mains thrust on number five, and you have main number one and it feeds rod number one, and you have main number five and it feeds rod number four. Then you have main number three, and it is split between rod number two and rod number three. We see a lot of engines when they die with a, with a stock crank, when they die of a rod bearing failure, a lot of the times we see it kill either rod number two or rod number three. Reason being, one of them opens up just, just a little bit, just a little bit. And now all of a sudden you have a path of least resistance and all your oil is going to that rod to fill that space. And now you're starving the other one. See, I don't and think that's how that happens at all. You don't? No the boy. only way a rod leaks is if it opens up on its side. On its the rod side. diameter it's isn't the thrust. leak path. The thrust... Mm -hmm distance is the leak path so unless your rod is magically actually wearing away it doesn't leak any faster really yeah because because I, I see a lot of two rod two or three unless i have now a two and three now two and three students notoriously fail because they're just the oiling system there is overtaxed compared to one and four so not disagreeing that that is what fails fair enough fair enough okay. but anyway to the point of this discussion yeah. is when, when you go to a nicer crane they're not exclusive. To the, the mains are not exclusively feeding those rods like on a stock setup. Now you have an oil path through the entire crank and balances out. Uh, and there's it, a more even oil flow. Yeah, there's a more even oil yeah. flow. Uh, and then. Well, what they do is they start picking oil up off of your two and four main and they basically well, double feed. So, you know, rod one now gets fed from main one and two, and rod yeah. two gets fed from two and three mains, and then so on and so forth. Sure. In a stock setup, you know, mains two and four, they're just along for the ride. They're just there to hold stuff and keep it from whipping around. Okay. So the shared oiling of the nicer cranks, it's a good thing to have. And there's a lot of nice cranks out there on the market. Um, sure. Now that's not that's not to discount the su the stock Subaru crank. You know, for what you get from the factory, a stock 79 millimeter crank is just under 400 bucks. And you know, it's a steal for what you get for the stock. Yeah. And if you're not going to be going crazy with it, it is more than adequate for just about anything that you would put it through. And, and I know Micah, Micah thinks, he, he looks down upon the 79 millimeter frame, but, but let's be honest, Subaru sells a lot of cars. I don't look down on them. They're great. I've got one in my daily driver. It's a yeah. little two-one stroker that I beat on. <laughs> yeah. And I spin oh, it to 8,500 RPM all the time. So, yeah. <laughs> no, no, but we know you prefer the two-liter crank, the 75. If I'm, well, if, if I'm making big power or if I'm racing it, sure. But Yeah. <laughs> there, there's definitely some benefits to it. Just there like are, you said, yeah. the, just from an oiling standpoint. And, there are. Yeah. But either way, either way, the, the, the crank that you get from Subaru, you know, it's no joke. For less than 400 bucks, you get a killer piece of equipment. There, there's a lot of engines that make a lot of good power with the standard 2.5 liter crank. Oh yeah. I'll say speaking to yeah. the quality of it back when I used to do my custom nitride batches. So I can't speak of the more recent cranks cause I haven't done the metallurgy on them in a long time. I sent them out and the metallurgy on it's really close to 4340 chromoly with the older part numbers. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it's actually really good material. They're nice cranks. They take a lot of abuse for what most people ask of them. Sure. Um, so, but, so going full circle, you know, when it comes to your, to your engine, and a long rod, we're doing, uh, our bread and butter is a 79 millimeter stroke, a plus two millimeter rod, and a piston that is appropriate for the compression ratio, right. and that longer rod. And can you, could you, because you've driven these 
could you highlight maybe something that you would notice? Like if, if you if you had two almost identical cars, one with the long red engine, one without, any mm -hmm. little subtle differences that you would notice with the long red engine Smoothness. versus stock? Smoothness. Okay. Um, I don't know if you remember, but uh, you know, many years ago, uh, when when my when my dad drove me and Abraham Lincoln to school on the family dinosaur, yeah. uh, Lexus <laughs> Lexus had just come out. They 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 were they were up branding their 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 Toyota uh, brand, but and I think it was Lexus. They they did the the champagne glasses on the hood, right? And they didn't fall. Yep. Uh, and it, because that's how smooth the motor. And it's, it's similar to that. If you took the same cars side by side, and one was a standard stroke, standard rod length, and the other one was standard stroke plus two, the one that's a plus two, it's, it's smoother. Okay. Uh, it's more responsive, which is interesting because the mass difference is not really enough to make that difference from responsiveness, but it feels more alive. It feels more responsive. It's more, you, you, you tap the throttle and things happen. There, there's less of a delay. Um, and, and you can just feel it when you build. Reciprocating mass, cough, sneeze, cough. Yes. <laughs> yeah. when, when, you build, when you build a motor that's a standard stroke and you put in the car and you, and you start it up and you feel it, it feels really smooth. Yeah, I did a great job building this motor. And then you go over and you, you put the same amount of care into building something that's a plus two rod and you put it in. And it is, it is a night and day difference hmm. of just how smooth the two of them are comparing one to the other. And you're talking 79 to 79 mil? Yeah, yeah 79 to 79. Yeah. Only, only difference being one's a plus two millimeter rod. Right. Is there, would there be any significant difference in where I'm thinking maybe of the skirt with, with the plus two millimeter rods? There is, uh, there is. Uh, we've, we've, we've torn down our fair share of engines, uh, standard rod and, and plus two rod. And I see considerably less skirt wear on the, uh, on the plus two rod setup. Uh, I know that there are, there are some concerns. Actually, I just had, uh, I had this, uh, this, this conversation with a very good machinist, engine machinist, uh, just last week about the ring pack. Uh, and he has a concern about having to move the ring pack closer to the crown and taking mm -hmm. up less space with that. Uh, <laughs> you're getting me back to where I wanted to talk about the four inch stuff from back when, but go ahead. Yeah. Back, Same reason. Back in the day. Um, and we'll and still I know, do it, but yeah. And I know he has a concern about where because on the ring packs and, and the strength of the rings and things like that. You know, mm. I haven't seen it. Uh, I understand his concerns and, 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 you know, I think they're valid, but I, on this setup, I haven't really seen accelerated ring wear from tightening things up. And, and the rings we're using, they're the same size as what normally comes on the pistons. So just so, to, to clarify what you're talking about here. So you have the three, like the two compression rings and the oil control ring on yes. the piston. So yeah. if you're moving the wrist pin up, mm -hmm. all three of those rings have to uh, take up a little bit less space. Right. So well, the rings, the rings, ideally, you know, comparing rings to rings, they're going to give you the same size rings that you're going to get on different compression rate, they're gonna give you one ring pack and that's that. So what you're really losing is, let's go to the EJ25 world. You know, everybody knows ring lands because ring land failures. What you're oh, doing boy. is you're compacting the ring lands themselves, not right. the rings. The, the material yeah. between each ring and the piston. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay, so, but you haven't, it hasn't, you haven't seen an issue with it, with the piston that you're using with the, with the rods. No, no, I, I haven't. And I understand it is a valid concern. And, you know, in, in, on the old school V8s or, or anything where you drop a, a piston, a rod assembly down from the top, a, an Evo motor, a straight four or a BMW straight six or anything like that. You know, you look at a piston and there's a bore for the wrist pin. And you would assemble the rod and the wrist pin together. You'd put the ring pack on, slam them into your bore gently. You'd, mm -hmm. you'd, you'd install the assembly. Ring compressor and all the appropriate yes, things. Yes, yes. You, you slam it in there. Yes. Yeah. All in. So, you know, don't say slam them home, but you would, you would install Gen it. Insert, it properly insert. install. Yeah. And, and with that, you could hang out like the oil control ring. You could hang it out over that, that bore for the wrist pin and drive it home. And it's not an issue. It's something that people, manufacturers have been doing even on stock setups for, for decades now. And it's been no big deal. 
The You're talking actually cutting the oil ring groove over the wrist pin opening. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Problem is with a Subaru engine or, or the EJ engine, the biggest problem is you've got to put the crank and the rods in the case and then put the piston in and get that wrist pin in. And right. if you've got rings covering that bore for the wrist pin, you can't get the wrist pin in. So you everything gotta get it on the D stroker game. Hmm? Yeah. The D stroker game, you drop two sides. So you actually drop two of them oh, in. The yeah. same little, and then because the rod's so long, you actually have to leave the case have spaced apart to feed the pin through. Yep. Because this, keep in mind that wrist pin never comes far enough down because the rod is now longer. And so on a plus yeah. four D stroker, you actually have to leave the case halves apart while you're putting the pins into the rods. This is, this is one of the secrets that like you guys have figured out that I, <laughs> I've, oh, I've, this, I've had some calls from people that like, this is impossible. This is, you oh. can't, it cannot be done. There is, I, I, there, <laughs> there is, there is a just perfect distance. And I'm going to tell you the secret to it. When, when you are, are you talking 79 mil stroke? I'm talking 75 millimeter stroke with a plus two with a plus two okay. and, then your, you're and your normal wrist pin location piston. The secret is this, you get a set of the half moons from the heads that go on the back yep. of the heads. You'll set down the case half that has the O-rings, you put those in place, you put your RTV on the other half, you put the half moons in at the corners, just barely in there. And it's your spacer. Yep. You bring it all down, and it is the perfect spacer to get your wrist in. Make sure not to smell your sealant. Yeah, you got to be real careful that you don't upset those O rings or anything between the cases. And okay, you don't smear the RTV. If you get your buddy to hold the upper case half, you slip the half wounds out, and you bring them together. Well, it's funny to yeah. me. I, this is back when I was consulting uh, Volvo Powertrain, Volvo Mac up in Maryland. I'd sold a, you know, plus four to a customer in Canada and uh, he, I get this call one day, I guess he gave my cell phone number to his machinist or engine builder. And I've got this guy just French Canadian cursing up a storm, this, that, and the other at me about how this thing won't go together. Apparently the customer never handed him the instructions on how to assemble. So he got this yeah. far in, he's following the factory service manual and he starts cursing at me, this, that, and the other. And that was, that was good times. Yeah. So there, it is, it is definitely something to leave to the professionals if you've not done this before. <laughs> Because that's just, the, the, just, the, the, you just dropped some some serious knowledge right there, Clint. So just thank you uh, just like doing measurements, you know. Uh, there's a there's a lot of guys. I know there's a lot of guys out there that use plastic gauge. I know there's probably a lot of engines out there that have been assembled using plastic gauge and they're running just fine. I won't do it. Yeah, I absolutely refuse. I will properly measure it, uh, and we'll actually measure. We'll get to the point that we're chasing a tenth of a thousandth of an inch just to get the clearances for the bearings just right. And we're opening multiple boxes of bearings and we are measuring the shells to find just that perfect one for the engine. Right. Um, you know, that's not to say that a plastic gauge engine isn't going to get you down the road, but I prefer not to do it. It's when it comes to engines, just kind of like the, the strokers and, and the rationale behind what package is going to make the most sense, that every little detail matters mm -hmm. so much. And, and you add those details together and the precision of those details together. And that's, that's the difference between like a very precise engine. It's something that is just maybe not going to work as well or live as long. And well, right. I'll say some of the things that come along with it is there are applications where an autocross, a D-stroke would be fantastic. Um, and a lot of this comes down to your gearing. So one of a uh, longtime customers of mine, uh, Tim, he, a lot of people probably know him and his monster 2.5 RS that he autocrossed and has like, I don't know, 335s on it or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, he'd been using some of my old uh, standard length 300M rods for a long time. And he's a 79 mil stroke guy. And he started chasing the low end torque, chasing all the low end torque, to the point he's snapping you know, internals and six speeds. He just sent me his re most recent time. He's making, I think it's like 570 pound feet of torque or something crazy. Wow. Uh, like 3,200 RPM, I think. Like, wow. yeah, we're talking, we're talking tractor setup. Yeah. But he's now on a three, five, four, five final drive. He literally got a custom front diff made for him. So they could still be stuck in second gear for the guys who are making gobs of torque, but still trying to keep the revs. And wow. I talk to him, I'm like, dude, it, it's, and this became a, a kind of a budget thing, which I was trying to get that with the crank is when mm -hmm. you look at doing a build. So it's like we can do a D stroker, in which case he would need a sleeve for the big bore to keep his displacement. Or he's at the point where, well, you end up building a closed deck block and, you know, forged crank. 
and offsetting the cost of the sleeve. So it's one versus the other, right? Yeah. And so it's which way do you want to go? So you can do that and run shorter gearing and gearing is a multiplier. So you're still essentially making a lot of torque. You need to look at your ratios in comparison yep. to a, you know, taller gear. Well, I should say shorter gear, three, five, four, five with more torque, which yeah. in turn, my discussion with him while he's breaking six speed stuff is putting the longer final drive on it, you know, makes it harder on the gears themselves, right? Uh, transfer gears and the transmission itself. Yeah. Um, but you just, you just briefly touched upon something that we should talk about uh, when talking about long rod setups, displacement. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the various forms of displacement. So very basically, there's, there's two ways that you can affect displacement on your engine. You can change the stroke, and we've talked about that quite a bit with different cranks, or you can change the bore. So sure. let's start with history again. You know, you have the two liter motor, 75 millimeter stroke, 92 millimeter bore, two liters. Throw in a 79 millimeter crank, you end up with a 2.1 liter stroker motor. It was really common back in 03, 04, 05. Well, they also sold them yeah. as two twos. Yeah. 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 A lot of rounding up. Yeah. A lot of, think, a lot of yeah. rounding up. I think if you uh, overboard to 90, was it 93, then it would get you closer to the two yeah, two two? Yeah. You're, you're over the hump yeah. there. Yeah. And the, and the sleeves in that case were monstrously thick. So, you know, it was never a concern. Um, then you have your standard off the shelf EJ257, EJ255 motor, 79 millimeter stroke, 99.5 millimeter bore, 2.5 liters. Yep. Now, doing a plus two rod in that. We haven't changed the bore, we haven't changed the stroke. Still 79 millimeter stroke, still 99 and a half on the bore, it's still 2.5 liters. Right. Okay. Now we talk about a destroker. So we have affected one of the factors that, that, uh, that goes into displacement. We've gone from 79 millimeters down to 75 millimeters. We have not changed the bore. You're now 2.34 liters. Now, like most Americans on this side of the pond where we're used to big V8s and displacement, and the old, the old saying, there is no replacement for displacement. You know, there is. It's a turbocharger. And, it's, right. and it's more revs. Sure. Because if you've got a car that's making 300 horsepower at 4,000 RPM, given its displacement, what happens if you take half that displacement and you break it out to 8,000 RPM? You know, you're going right. to make the 300 horsepower. It's just going to be higher revs. Well, so, it's where, it, where do you make ignoring the friction and some other things. Well, but... we're ignoring other factors. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, I'm talking in general layman's terms. Well, well this, is, this, this is really where the D-stroker gets nerdy. Um, so in all practicality, given the same bore, you lose 5% of displacement D-stroking. Okay. It's, it's a little like 5.0 something. I don't remember the number offhand. So um, your, your, your 75 millimeter plus two setup is going to be a two, three, four. Funny thing is, if I do a plus four setup, I've not changed from 75 millimeters stroke. I've not changed my bore. It's still 2.34 liters. Right. So then that's going to beg the question, why would I do a plus four millimeter rod as opposed to a plus two millimeter rod? Okay. And we come, back, we come back to what you talked about, that triangle. Yep. Wrist head to skirt to crank you've now lessened the angle even more. So you've reduced side load. You've reduced stress on those components even further. And you're also reducing reciprocating mass if done correctly. Yeah. If, you're, if you're not a lazy piston designer. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's so, worth, uh, just real quick, it's okay. worth probably mentioning how important part selection is when making these differences. Oh yeah. I mean, it, the, the rod, not every rod is going to be the same and not every piston is going to be the same. Correct. And you, you've, you both hit on a lot of the reasons for that, but I think it's worth mentioning, especially in this case, like if you're going plus two or plus four, that the, the build of the rod, the, the metallurgy of the rod, the weight of the rod, all of these things become really important, especially mm -hmm. if you're going to de-stroke the engine and start to rev it higher. Mm -hmm. So it's, you, you really have to take, it, it's worth taking more time and care to select those components if that's the application because, because even just selecting the components of the build 
uh, the pieces you're using to build the engine, it, it becomes really key at that point. Right. And, and don't get me wrong, you can still grab your, you know, Chinese, you know, steel rod, you can grab an Eagle, a Manly, I mean, the, let's see, the, the Boost Line, any of them, they're, they're all Chinese steel. Yeah. Um, you can pick them all up and you can still make great power on them. Usually they're a lot heavier. There's some pretty chunky rods and sometimes you have good batches, sometimes you have bad batches. Right. Um, so controlling what you get, and I, I've gone down the avenue of trying to source, you know, seeing what forgings are available from China. Um, and uh, that's a whole separate issue because uh, okay. okay. <laughs> US, forging, US forgings are actually getting hard to find. Like Carrillo and Potter are the only people that I know that are in the Subaru world that still actually use US steel. Um, wow. on their well, base all right. product. So we, we need, we need to qualify this because, you know, Micah and I have been, we work quite closely. We actually talk several times a day uh, on okay. projects uh, and we nerd out back and forth on things. Uh, and we have a number of items in the works coming up. Okay. But with that being said, we have been chasing a whole rod manufacturer and forging problem for three years now. Uh, th like that's that. a two. Two years. Two? Yeah. And we're still, we're still fighting that. Um, and a number of factors at play here. Uh, but uh, Oh, I, I should stipulate, signs will still sell you U.S. forgings, but no one wants to play? pay for them, so it's well, tricky. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and perhaps, you know, to give people an idea, like, you know, cost of some of this stuff that's involved, Micah, well, how much does the U.S. forging cost? Just a blank forging, or are you talking like a finished actual rod? Like, uh, so... If you're talking like a set of rods that are U.S. forgings, like uh, my 4340s, just standard off-the-shelf rod, I buy them in sets of 25, it's an $890 set of rods. I mean, it, it's U.S. forgings, it's not cheap, they come with L19 rod bolts, and, you know, it's just, it's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not, that's, I mean, it's, it's maybe 40% more than, than kind of your standard kind of standard run of the mill rod, but it is, I mean, it's a little bit higher. But meanwhile, you can go buy a plus two H beam from Manly for 500 bucks. Sure. And the other thing you have to keep in mind so. is you, your typical owner in this market, they're not proactive. They, they throw a bunch of bolt-ons on the car. They much make as much power as they possibly can. They, they run their budget ragged. And then you have a surprised Pikachu when it blows up. And they don't have the budget to fix it. So now everything is budget conscious. Sure. Well, and, and, and I would say too, like uh, if you're going to use a lot of special parts and, and you are building a race car, mm -hmm. you know, availability of those parts, uh, it becomes a question. Availability and, of spares, should you need them. Of spares, yeah. and, and, and you tend to be a little bit more proactive when you're building something like that. Sure, Whereas right. your, your typical street car owner, they're not, they're not planning their next short block. They're not thinking about their next short or block. Or knowing when they're going to refresh or want to build a spare. Or yeah. want to build yeah. a spare or know when they're going to refresh. They just know that, hey, I, I broke a piston. Hey, I blew out a bearing. Uh, right. You know, I need, I need a new short block right, right now. now, today. And, and actually, uh, you know, the guys at IAG, you know, it, it, they've got this stuff down because they have short blocks on the shelf ready to go they have figured out sure. that your subaru owner is typically not they don't have a spare short block tucked in the corner of the garage and they just they built their engine and need something tomorrow because right. they're in a they, rental camry yeah yeah right. I'm, I'm i'm borrowing grandma's car she needs to go to church on sunday and it's <laughs> wednesday yeah. uh, and i need my car running so i can go back to school you know that's we run into that a lot and and the guys at iag you know i I'll bet, I'll bet if we called them up right now, they would have 50 short blocks sitting on the shelf. 50 is a big Possible. number. But that's a, oh, yeah. I'll bet they do. I'll they would have something. They would have something on the shelf. Up, I'm I know trying to remember. I know J Rick and I'll JJ. say JJ shared a picture where they're like uh, setting up their, I think it was line honing for the day. They had like 20 blocks lined up, yeah. something like that. So yeah, they, they yeah. move. I guarantee, John, when you put this out there, I guarantee Rick and JJ are going to see it. So Rick and JJ, I want you to go back there and tell me how many short blocks you have on the shelf <laughs> right okay. now. And Leave I'll it in the comments. Text, guys. Yeah. Don't, don't tell Clint he's right. Yeah. I'll bet it's more than 50. But yeah. those, I'll have Jeanette make you a sandwich. You know what I'm talking about. And they, yeah. they have figured it out. And, and, you know, really, and this touches upon a good thing. Um, there's a lot of good engine builders out there for Subaru. There's a lot of bad engine builders out there for Subarus. Do your research. Go look up who you're buying an engine from. Talk to them. Tell them what you're going to do. I know that with the new 
Pastrana video with the 234 motor, that that's a hot topic. I've been getting a lot of phone calls about it myself, just constantly over and over and over again, because that's a hot topic and people are interested in that. And for a lot of people, it's not an appropriate motor, especially in something like a daily drive. Yeah. Now we have built some for some folks that are daily drivers and they understand that it's not, it's not for racing from a stoplight. It's not a tractor motor. It's not a torque monster, but man, if you want to rev it out, go for it. Well, well here, let, let's get to some things, you know, back to the actual D stroke or long rod sure. uh, discussion side of things. And so earlier I mentioned, you know, you get 5% less displacement. Of course, as anyone knows, that swept displacement, most of that energy from that displacement, you know, about 60% of it goes out through heat rejection and everything else. So you only get so much return on that actual given displacement in terms of making power at the crank. So when you look at that, we'll just give it rough numbers. You now have essentially a two and a half percent loss in power for the given D stroke for the given volume, you know, talking, getting nerdy, talking, break mean effective pressure, like what's your, sure. the actual work, how you're going to define it. So then the thing you have to do in order to make up that loss in power, if you're staying with the same bore, is you're looking at the changes that you have in reduced friction. You're looking at improved combustion efficiency because you spend more time at top dead center. You have more time for the combustion to happen. You give yourself more grace period in terms of timing to find knock limits. So when you're actually talking about finding, you know, that, that break point where you're not going to throw any more time, you get reduced returns on how much time you're putting in. That's where you're just running that knock threshold. Uh, mm -hmm. Proge, I've talked a lot about that when, they're running, you know, 10 to one on essentially pump gas with water injection and WRC is they're running such a ragged edge of the more pressure you put on something, it becomes like a knife edge that the more precise it comes to you're good or now you're knocking. Um, it gives you a bit more grace period because it, again, it slows down everything at that top end, your valves mm -hmm. opening and closing your overlap times playing with ABCS, it slows it down. Uh, at the same time, you're not hanging open down at bottom mid center as long. So again, this is where it goes to having the right formula for the right cams to do the job. Um, okay. But in can, terms of power, it's, it's yeah. really not that hard to make up the difference in power, especially when you can rev higher. Right. So because, can, yeah. go ahead. Well, just be, if you could rev higher and stay efficient in a higher PM range, you, you don't have to make as much torque to make as much power. Say it again. If you could rev higher, if you can spin the engine faster, mm -hmm. you don't have to make as much torque to make the same amount of power. Well, yeah. So horse po horsepower is essentially calculated from torque. Right. So it's your torque value times your RPM divided by 5252. In yep. you know, our units, you know, I'll say yep. our units, horsepower yep. and foot pounds of torque. Uh, so you can calculate at any given point. If someone gives you torque value on an RPM, you know what their horsepower is or vice versa. Right. So correct. And that's where I was talking about. You won't have the same torque at the wheels with the long right. rod, but if you have shorter gearing, so you're doing the same speed, you have a greater torque multiplier in your drive line. Right. So the actual torque to the ground is different. Um, could you, could you talk a little bit about how the cam selection changes, especially with the D-stroke engine? Well, so again, it's such an I mean, engine. I don't know how, I don't know how far you want to go in there, but just maybe just some starting well, so in general, uh, kind of your, your gross rules of thumb still apply. So higher RPM, you want longer duration. Um, the bigger thing that really changes so isn't that our... To have the valves open longer. Correct. Like, so the cam is hoping, holding the valves right. open longer. So, Correct. Because right. what happens is engine speed increases, your actual time to get air in and out. So talking mass right. flow, it doesn't care how fast you're going. It's still right. trying to move some amount of air. So for the amount of time that the valve is actually open, right. you have less time to fill that given cylinder. So you yep. do a wider duration, longer duration. So the valve is now open longer, trying to give you that same actual time in seconds. You know, we're talking milliseconds here, yep. actual time in seconds to fill the cylinder. So as you're going higher, you run into other issues that are limiting you. Right. So you start yep. fighting some other things. So this is where it's not a, a, always super it's, beneficial. I, I've made a point to many people. There, there seems to be a perception that if you can just rev the engine higher, you'll just magically make more power. So long and as it, you can feed it. <laughs> as long yeah. as you can feed it. It doesn't, doesn't, it's not automatic. It's yeah. not that simple. Right. And, and the thing is for most people to, you know, people all the time, I'm sure Clint's had the same problem with T-strokers because they want to spend it nine, 10,000 RPM. I'm like, yeah, you can. Yeah. You won't yeah. make power there. Like you're talking, you know, a 35 R sized frame, you know, 60 to 70 pound a minute turbo. You're shifting by 8,000, 8,500 maybe if you're really, and the torque curve's dropping at that point. Like mm -hmm. they're just, 
you just don't have enough mass flow from the turbo. Like you really need a big turbo to make something that's, you know, 2.4, 2.5 liters fed and be happy at, you know, nine, 10,000 RPM. Because mm -hmm. that, that displacement, back to the displacement point, that's how much air the engine is moving in a given combustion cycle, like right. in, in, with all four cylinders. Right. If and you're so, spinning the engine faster, you have to feed a lot more air and a lot more fuel into that cylinder because the yeah. volume, the volume doesn't change. You're, you're actually forcing the engine to feed the, the air and the fuel mixture in more, more quickly because you're spinning it faster. So it, it's not that, that when, when, if you realize it that way, you realize well, that's actually kind of a chore. That's difficult. It's not easy. Let, yeah. You start narrowing your window for the same. Let, let's, of, talk about, yeah. let's talk about the cams though, the duration, because that's something that comes up quite often. Um, sure. You know, should I get aftermarket cams? It, again, it all depends. And, and I'll preface this like doing stuff with, with, with engines and cars, it's all a series of compromises. And it's yeah. the compromise to get you to the best fit to what you're looking for. But you've heard of people, they'll, they'll do a cam and, and they'll talk about moving their power band to the right using a big cam. And they're just, they're shoving the power, available power, further and further up in that RPM range. And again, if you're living down here in the low end of the RPM range, and your, your engine's not gonna make any real power or the best efficiency for the upper RPM range, you have a mismatch of, of components. Right. Whereas if you're planning on making your power in the upper end, then start looking at your points and things like that. And, and there's, it's interesting, when Dom was here, we started playing around with, uh, with mixed cam duration. Uh, you know, most, most of the cams that you'll see uh, out there for the sewers, they're, they're They'll do a stage one and stage two cam, and they're pretty close in duration, both intake and exhaust. And we started playing around with a longer duration exhaust cam. Mm -hmm. uh, and sure. I don't, I don't remember what the specs were off. The we did it on the, uh, did that on the race car. We did it on the race car. I did a two seventy six intake and a two eighty exhaust. Well, won't get yep. all, but yeah. yeah. On the silver car, and what led to that was we were playing around with on the old two liter EJ two hundred five. We were playing around with the stock intake cam and the STI exhaust cam, which is just, just a touch more duration than the stock WRX exhaust cam. And it made mm -hmm. a nice, it, made, it was a nice combo. It was a really nice combo for that. Well, it has a good bump and lift too. Yeah, it yeah. does. So It does. So we started playing around with that more. We, you know, Mike and I played around a bit on the, on the, on the silver car, the, the old time attack car. Uh, and then when Dom was here, we, we contacted a cam manufacturer and we had some prototype cams made. Uh, and I don't remember the specs off the top of my head, um, but uh, um, they worked really, really well, and we were very happy with them. Um, if 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 any of you know Mike Sims, uh, he's on the forums. Motorbike Mike is his user ID. You'll see him mm -hmm. all the time. He got one of the first sets of those cams, and he 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 will tell you about them all day long, and and he will talk to you if you want somebody that will talk to you about engines all day long. He's your guy, uh, and but it, mm -hmm. he's tried. He's another old school D-stroker. He is an old he is an old school D-stroker. Uh, I've actually built uh, some D-strokers uh, for for some friends of his. Um, great guy, loves to talk engines, but he has played around with all sorts of different cam combinations, and he really likes that longer exhaust duration as well. That's worked out sure. for him. Um, that's that's a really interesting idea, but it makes a lot of sense. It, it, you know what's interesting is Evos do it. Mm. <laughs> I mean, granted, sure. entirely way easier, different. way easier to play with cams well, on those. Well, it, well, we're also kind of getting back in the, the subject and me thinking about cams. It's the same as rod ratio and a bunch of other things. Is think of your torque, your torque curve, right? Your torque curve is realistically your volumetric efficiency curve. That's yes. really what it is. And what you have is you have things like your rod ratio and cam selection and turbine housing sizing, all these things that kind of shift. It's kind of a seesaw. It's not like you're going to do something that's going to go all one way or the other. It's kind of seesaw. It starts tilting. And if you get really drastic, you're going to be that big single turbo Supra that Clint was talking about earlier, where it's everything's way up at the top. And that was your trade-off. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can go the other way. You can be a D-stroker with small cams and, you know, a VF37 and have, you know, all your torque can be shifting at 5,000 RPM because you got yeah. nothing left. I, I had that. Yeah. Had and, that. And, and, and there are pros and cons. Yeah. For someone who wants to be able to pass a guy on the interstate without downshifting, by all means, there's a yeah. spot for that, you know? There is. But um, you, you made a really important point there, Micah, that I just want to like clarify and hit home if, if pe for the people that are still watching about the volumetric efficiency. 
when, when you're when you're looking at your your dyno plot look pay it, it pays to pay attention to your torque curve because what that volumetric efficiency it, it it really boils down to efficiency how efficient is your engine working at any given point so wherever your torque curve is peaking that is the rpm where your engine is most efficient and like the the more gradual that curve the wider the efficiency ranges of the engine the narrower like that the more peak like that curve the less the, the narrower the range that the engine is operating efficiently right so when yep. you're when you're looking at like like if think working, of a bolt-on stock turbo sti yeah big torque comes up and makes it like torque mountain and it falls off really hard right it's and running it's, out it's of its efficiency all staggered down low the heads aren't flowing the cams are yep. you know emission spec right they're, they're clean yep. cams we'll put it that way well, and it, you got a small turbo and yeah, yeah. Small turbo. We are into with rally too. Like when you put a restrictor in front of the turbo, you get no, you that, can get the a whole big different world. Up. But yeah. Oh man, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> I will okay. Up, there's, uh, okay. Time out. We'll Stay away. on subject. We'll okay. <laughs> but it's but it's it's really important to remember that that torque curve, the shape of the torque curve. Think of it as that is where your engine is operating efficiently. Mm -hmm. yeah, and we call it here. We call it the area under the curve. Yep. The bigger area under the curve, the more fun you're gonna have. Yes. And, and this plays know. back into choosing which engine you want, especially, and I say this to the motorsports guys, if you're racing, the area under the curve dictates your power band where you'll actually be operating. So if yeah. you've got this really peaky thing that's 2,000 RPM, well, guess what? Best case, a downshift is an upshift. You, you're talking 2,000 RPM window. There's no downshift and I'm 1,000 RPM or 2,000 RPM below where I want to be coming on this, you know, on this back straight or something. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where the D-Stroker initially was designed is we weren't designing it to have, you know, 10,000 RPM of power. It was designed in right. our case, much like I was, you know, in an autocross situation or road race situation, that you essentially have the extra RPM as an over rev to avoid another upshift and downshift in the next right. corner. So if you're at that corner, instead of grabbing just oh, banging it in fifth and I'm going to come right back into fourth, I'm even fifth for a split second, you can stay mad. Stay in there. Right. And so to, to a certain extent, was, it was, sounds like it was influenced almost by the ratios of the super transmission as much as anything else. So you could stay in a gear a little bit longer, get a little bit more use it, out it of the gear. Well, it wasn't driven by the specific ratios, no. It was driven okay. by the fact that, you know, when you're on track, there are those corners because we're not a race team. We can't ideally set up the perfect right. gear stack for each track. Right. It's not realistic to us, especially with the Subaru. Like, we can't even get away with doing a, you know, a winter's quick change rear end. Right. Because we've got a front diff. Right. So you, you run into real world situations where we're not on sequentials. So we can't just, you know, have a 50 millisecond shift time that, that's not here. So... If you have to do another upshift and another downshift, that's lost time. If you got two corners like that, you're, you're realistically well, well. losing a second yeah. on a lap now. If you could have held that gear without having to shift, you'd stayed in power. Though your torque curve's falling, you're still making power. It's time you're not clutched in, uh, not under power, grabbing your gear, you know, getting back into power to get right back out of it and downshift yeah. again. So it was so, used with that in mind, I'll yeah. put it that way, is how it started. So, so, so going back around, because we keep, we keep touching on this and we're supposed to be talking about long rods. You know, the plus two setup, 79 millimeter stroke on a 2.5 EJ 257, 255, it's a great setup. Mm -hmm. You still have the stroke, you still have the displacement, and you have less wear and stress on the components because of the reduced rotting. Yeah. That's, that's bottom line, my bread and butter engine right there. And, and, and hearing it laid out and, and kind of going through this discussion, like now I understand why, why would you build a stock length rod engine mm -hmm. if, if for a nominal increase in cost, you have this option as well. It's, There's, not, even, it's not even a nominal increase in cost. The, yeah. the, the plus two rods have become so common now right. that, that you can- you There's can, no increase in cost. There's really no, no increase in cost. The, the price is equivalent. Go look at the price of, uh, of my two plus two street engine. So stage yep. two. Rods and pistons, plus two, two, so plus two millimeter rod. Right. Look at that price compared to a normal length stage two engine. Well, funny from, that. From, anyway, Literally, yeah. just go look up the part numbers. Look up a standard rod H beam versus. Mm -hmm. I know it's you. It's the same foundries in China. You can call them. It's the same forging mill machine. The they don't care if you have more or less material taken off, whether it's a one thirty point right. five or a one thirty two point five. It's the same price on the boat coming over. Now the, right. now, the biggest problem when doing, like, so let's say you're budget conscious and you want to do a D-stroker, you know, you're talking a 75 millimeter stroke. Hey, you can buy that from Subaru, less than 400 bucks. Yep. 
Micah claims there's an off-the-shelf piston. He's going to prove it to me with a part number. I looked. They killed the 9.5. Uh-huh. They don't have uh -huh. It's only a 9.0. Oh. So you come to Turning Concepts after he has the after I have the uh, custom pistons ma made to take care of this. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, it's an off the sh it's going to be an off-the-shelf piston. The price is going to be appropriate as for, for an off-the-shelf part. Right now, doing a cheap plus four, the expensive part's the rod. Sure. Because there's not a cheap plus four rod out there. There's expensive plus four rods. And, and when I say expensive, I mean, when I say expensive- It's, it's not I a Chinese mean, rod, yeah. It's <laughs> not a Chinese rod. It's, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a very nice rod. It's made here in the US. It's a low volume part. All of that is effective. Now, if you were to take a set of rods, a, a, you know, four cylinder set of rods for 900 bucks and you go to a professional race team and they go, hey, these are 900 bucks. Wow, that's really cheap. Sure, sure. I, I won't talk what our pinkle stuff cost. <laughs> I don't even want to know. Actually, I kind of do. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. Okay. But but if you go if you go to your 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 typical setup, your stage two customer, and you tell them, hey man, these rods are nine hundred dollars. That's a tough pill to swallow. It it can be, but I think just like we've talked about, if you're going to if you really need the destroked engine, if you yep. really are going to be building because it's it's the whole engine build. It's not just the short it block. It's is. everything. That it's it's everything to do with the heads, the valves, the cams, the turbo selection, everything. If you're going to build it to the point where you need, where, where the two three is an ideal displacement, and you're going to be moving to the upper RPM range for your ideal power band, having a good value or having a, a really good quality rod and piston, it will pay dividends as you use the engine more. Up, uh, you know, basically yeah. building to that configuration. Yeah, right. and actually, um, we're, we're building a plus four right now for my comic uh, for, for this season. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we have it done in the start of the season, for the start of the season. But it's going to be a 234 mm -hmm. plus four millimeter rod. Still now, a 23 mil pin? Yeah. And then to contrast that, we have Peter Zhang's car, the other car that we're helping out with Time Attack, Global Time Attack, uh, or not Global, um, Grid Life. Grid Life. Grid Life, yeah. Um, he is going to be running a plus two 79 millimeter stroke. Okay. Both, both are going to be very similar in a number of other factors. Now, there are, there are some differences. I've done some special stuff on Mike's heads. Peter's, I have not done the special stuff that I do. And that's all for a different discussion. But okay. we're going to have a two, three, four plus four out there, and we're going to have a two, five plus two out there, running you can side. See how they both run? Yeah. See how they both run. So I'm curious. Are they both ninety nine seven five bore? Yes. Okay, so five percent displacement difference. Okay. Mm -hmm. Both ninety nine seven five bore. Similar uh, turbos, similar cams. What's similar turbos, slightly different cams, and the biggest difference is I didn't do Peter's heads. Those I'll be doing a set of heads for him a little bit later on. Okay. But, uh, you know, Mike is going to be running a set of heads that, uh, that I did some special sauce stuff to, uh, and, and then we can talk about that. A what size turbos are those guys on now? Uh, 3076 Gen 2, I think it is. Okay. okay. Well, if I get time, I'll get my 243 together and uh, go out there with one of my Two turbos. Three. Fun. Yeah. Four inch bore. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And then, and then to top all of this off, Micah and I have been working on another project uh, that, that's a super destroker. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is this you want to talk eight? about that? Oh, sure, why not? This is this is... the 1.8 crank? No, uh, no. 1.8 no. one, one no. crank is actually still 75 mil. Oh, okay. Uh, there's the EJ15 crank. That was the 65.8 millimeter or whatever. Yeah, still not short enough. There. Uh, not no, sure. uh, so this is this is... Sport, by, wasn't it Rally Sport Direct who was doing their... It, Rally Sport. I don't know where that project is. I haven't heard an update. I think yet. it got stalled. So they, they started doing their land speed record car. Right. Where they well, want to do a well, one liter EJ. And so naturally me being the nerd, I'm like, well, that's really, really the wrong way to do it. So the, okay. their, their, original well, I, plan, I, their, their original plan is they're going to take a two liter. They're going to pull two slugs out of it. And they're going to leave and basically make basically rods and pistons removed from two of the bores block off, you know, remove valve train and block off any oil galley. So it's not just block off any oil galleys, block off any valve, any valve yeah. holes. So you don't get reversion or anything like that. So they were going to take a, a, a 205 and, and basically just close off to two cylinders and, and run that for land speed record for salt okay. flats. 
Okay. And I think the record, I think the production car record is like 129.7. I don't even think it was that. I think it was like 119 or something. But yeah, it was low. Really low. Um, so, so they started talking about that. And to which, and, and I'll, I'll admit, you know, triggered some thinking. And a whole bunch of phone calls back and forth between Michael and myself. Yeah. Uh, about, you know, we could build something and we could give it a shot. Well, so well we, it was basically me telling you what I wanted to do when I'm crazy. So I'm full yeah, of that. I kept this, telling okay? you, and I kept telling you, no, that's too complicated. Do it this way. Yeah. So um, it, it's essentially knocking the stroke in half. Okay. Um, looking at a wow. 36 and a half millimeter stroker, D stroker, ultimate D stroker. Um, and because it's supposed to be, you know, budget conscious, I've got a buddy who's going to be turning the crank for me, keeping it budget. Um, that's the only expensive part. Realistically, other than that, it's just some JE pistons, uh, some Evo rods. Um, so yeah, 4G63 wow. rods. Okay. Uh, They're nice and know, long. With some machining, I'll chuck it on the mill and, you know, make them fit. But uh, so doing it on the Uber budget. And uh, I've been running some calculations and some numbers and it should be fun. So, so it's yeah, gonna... I've been discussing this project ad nauseum for a year and a half on that one. That sounds wild. Totally wild. I, so, I would love to see it actually run. Yeah, it's well, like socked in somewhere in the realm of fourteen to fifteen thousand RPM. So yep, it should be yeah. fun. Yeah. I mean kind of like I mean, probably idling at like six thousand and um wherever it'll be happy. I'm, I'm not really <laughs> yeah. worried about the idle. Wherever it'll idle to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Uh the, you know, it's it's you, you start talking realms like that, you're talking, you know, uh what's an R one street bike idle at? What is an F one car idle at? Yeah. So yeah. look at the numbers, you're talking a bore stroke ratio like that of the C eight. Um, you know, the 2.4 Cosworth F1 mm -hmm. engine. You're talking a rod ratio like that of the Yamaha M1, you know, the GP Moto engine. Uh, realistically, I just don't have pneumatic valve train and all the other crazy stuff. Part of my challenge is I wanted to stay on valve springs. And yeah. I have a lot of background with uh, the struggle of high RPM valve springs with lift from my NASCAR days. Okay, um, sure. So I've got some fun little things I'll do with that. But uh, Man, I... T yeah, there's we'll destroked and then there's destroked i guess yeah, there's, there's, <laughs> there's destroked and then there's really long rod yeah, yeah. so this is, this is still very much a pipe dream uh and we got to figure out the budget to do it so well, i've got the I, well i'm getting parts here for it all ready to go i've got both turbos i've i've got the block i've got the heads i sourced my uh version had, 8 ra had, heads we've had those parts for like three years now no i literally got them since this started Oh, okay. oh my gosh. i've spun all the cams i've oh you want to get the cams i've i've spun them all i've got all the curves now so yeah, so, wow. so we're we're working on some new stuff to help fund this this thing. Yeah, okay. buy parts. We'll do dumb stuff with the money. Yeah. Yes, we we're, that's exactly <laughs> that's what that's, we're a, that's as much motivation as we should anybody should need. Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah. So so basically, Micah has been has been uh, burning up his SolidWorks license on some stuff, and, nice. and he and I a lot of it's spreadsheets, jerk numbers, and camp spreadsheet. doing all the valve train stuff longhand. Yeah. Um. Wow. And and uh, we've got some interesting stuff in the works that you're going to see uh, that he's going to come out with. You're going to be able to buy it through Turning Concepts. Um, wow! We're actually, we're working on something that I think is a killer idea. That if we can just get some of the machine work down, I, I think it's going to be great. Well, I, I currently got my four axis sitting in storage, so I need a shop space now, big enough for that machine. But that's a separate story. Man. Um, actually, I will say yeah. some of the things we have coming, yeah. I've mentioned to you, John, I, I kind of want to get you to test some of them because they're related to the things that are near and dear to your heart. Okay. Um, so oh, okay. cool. I'd like to have a, a, another, you know, honest opinion running compared to some other stuff you have. But. Well, I don't know if you, I don't know if you want to go down that road yet. Maybe because we've, we've, I've taken a lot of your time and I, I want to thank you guys for coming out, but we've, I think maybe this is a good stopping point for the longer discussion. And maybe yeah. this just means we need to come back and I mean, Man, if, if you guys well, there, want to talk there, cams. There, there's more long rod to go on, but uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it depends how in-depth and dirty you want to go with the numbers, but yeah. Well, I think for, for, for an intro, this is pretty good. I think, is, we're, I think we're good, good right now. I think yeah. we're pretty darn good. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, I mean, talking about the cams, I think maybe even compression ratio would be something interesting. So maybe if I could twist you guys' arms and get you guys to come back and we can- Yeah, compression ratio, bore size. One of the things we were t touching on earlier was the knock. The bigger the bore, you have yeah. knock control issues, but you have more room for quinch pad, which means you push knock at bay. And we do the need, quinch pad, need, the more room you have to push your ring land up. And you start getting all this like really nerdy side of yeah, stuff. Yeah, we do but. need to talk about things like quinch pad. And we do need to talk about, you know, engine speed versus knock and, mm. and, and flame fronts and, and those types of things and, and a lot of really nerdy stuff. So, yeah. Well, that's um, it. I, I'm holding you both to it. We're going to come back and we're going to nerd out again. Okay. okay. Um, and then uh, 
let's see, do you have any wrap up questions on the long run stuff that you want to talk about? We, we, have, I, we have hit all my questions. Okay. I have one quick up wrap one that I wanted to yep. get with people. Um, I know there's a big nomenclature. The most people think a long rod, you can spin it higher, faster for a given thing. So the old rule of thumb with mean piston speed was 25 meters per second. So using that same value, one of the things is everyone's like, oh yeah, well, you will be able to spin the D stroker faster than the other one. And because they're literally just linear related by stroke, they all end up having the same swept volume at the same mean piston speed. So whether you're talking 83, 79, or 75 for the same flutter of rings, that's kind of where mean piston speed kind of became a limit is ring packs and ring control actually sealing okay. the combustion, uh, they all have the same swept volume. So it's not that one's going to be making way more displaced volume than the other. So that's where it becomes an issue of chasing the efficiencies where the long rod slows everything down, reduces the friction, so on and so forth. So it, it's all a balancing act. It's, like you said, it's, you know, it's a recipe. You, you got to put the right things together for it to be able to shine. Right. So, and, right. And, in, and in the end, if you're shopping for an engine and, and you have an idea of, of, you know, in your head, oh, I'd love a two, three, four because I saw a video and the thing revved and it made 800 horsepower. Well, it's, there's yeah. a lot more to it than just the bottom end. Yeah. And and best thing you could do is go to your engine builder. Tell them what your end goal is. If your end goal is to simply just have a D-stroke motor, sure. Big deal. Right. You know. There, there's more to consider, though. There's more to yeah. consider. And tell them what you're going to do with the car. And, and it's like your doctor. Be upfront. You know. Yes. Yeah. I don't. Yes. I don't care. I don't care what you're doing with the car. I don't care if you're going, you know, down to LA and blocking off Pizza Boy from the street and street racing. But be up front so you get the right thing to do what you right. want. Right. Yep. It's it's so it's so important to actually like have it be able to clearly communicate what your actual goal is and why. Mm -hmm. Because the, the more that you talk to, to anybody, like, like any of us here or, or engine builders or, ex, or an experienced shop, the better information you give us, the better information we can give you back, and the better we can make sure that you're going to get something that actually will do what you, what you really want to do. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And yeah, be, be realistic about the power goals that you ultimately are going to be making. You know, everybody's like, yeah, I want to make 800 wheel horsepower. But meanwhile, there's still a stock turbo. Like, they're so far from doing that. That's not what you need to build for. Yeah. Unless you're dropping 30 grand right now to literally build everything for 800 horsepower. Right. I got to I got to tell you, you know, I have a, I have a sweet spot idea, you know, the, the ideal Subaru engine sweet spot power standpoint, like just on a daily driver. Talking EJ. Yeah. EJ, you know, between 350 and 400 horsepower. Yeah. I was going to say 400. In I'll say 400, in 400. Opinion, that is, that is the sweet spot for a daily driven fun Subaru. It's, yep. you're going to be faster than 99% of the stuff out there. It's going to be fun to drive. Put and a it's smile not, on your face. And, and it's not going to nickel and dime you to death. It's yep. before you know all the exotic stuff too. You, you don't need all the crazy stuff yet. No, yep. you don't. You don't, need the, you don't need the super lightweight ultra material rods. You can use the off the shelf stuff. Yep. And it'll work and it'll do great. And you can have fun with it every single day. Yeah. Like right now, I'm looking at a Legacy GT wagon project for my daily driver. Just because I like wagons and it's a manual Legacy GT and I've wanted one. Um, yeah. And yeah, like realistically, I'm looking at like a 6758 or 7163. I uh, have both sitting in the garage and just a 25. I mean, I love a D stroker, but be able yeah, to just have it in gear and lug it and it'll have plenty of torque and you're not revving the nuts off the thing at every stoplight to get going. Yeah. You're not, you're not burning up a clutch and you're not over revving things. And, and, it's, and it's not too much of a handful. Like no. Yep. From, you know, no. through the whole course of the year. No. You yeah. can drive it every single day and it's still a lot of fun. Yep. Absolutely. Very cool. Right. Well, as, as good a place as any to end. I mean, it's basically you guys just like gave away so much secrets of the Subaru engine like world. It's phenomenal. Well, there's, a, there's, there's still a lot. There is still a lot. And, and there's I'm so many fundamental issues. There's so much to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> then then we're, gonna, we're just going to have to do this again. I'm going to hold you guys to it. <laughs> Sounds good. This is, this is yep. an absolute blast. And thank you guys very much for your time for coming out. Oh, no, um, thanks for having me on. So, Micah, so they can find you at 3 My Racing. Yeah, three of my racing uh, dot racing. com or Facebook's probably where I'm more active at or okay. Instagram as well. But Clint, yeah. turningconcepts.com. Turningconcepts.com. Uh Facebook, Instagram, your normal social media channels. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, or you can call. And if you call for God's sake, please leave a message. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Just say something. 
Just say something. Or just hang up. And, and give me a callback number. Yeah. Don't don't call and hang up and 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 call and hang up. Just just yes. leave a message. That this is what this is what emails are for. Yep, just email is great. Yep. Email yes. is great. I'm not going to answer the phone at one in the morning, but when I can't sleep at night, I'm probably going to check email. Nice, nice. Well, brilliant. Well, thank you guys so much for coming out and doing this. Thanks yeah, for your time. Awesome. Really appreciate it. I can't wait to get this out there and and uh, just kind of get some more some good information out there about stuff that I wanted to know more about and that I knew that you guys could, could shed all of your, your knowledge and experience on. So I greatly appreciate it. Yeah. And, and Hey, if you come up with any other questions or anything like that, shoot an email over and we'll answer them. We'll do it. Absolutely. Um, I'll get you some you know graphics to go along with the comparison of different rods and stuff and some that sort yeah. of stuff. But. So I'll put this out as a video and, yeah. and I'll, I'll, yeah, whatever graphics you've got, tell me where you, what Working they're about. Of, and we'll we'll yeah. throw them up there. So okay. don't have to look at our ugly faces and stuff all the time. <laughs> <laughs> my my yeah beards and long hair that needs my to be covid hair <laughs> I, I'm, I'm i'm masked i'm 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 a superhero today so <laughs> there you go nice. Cool. nice well thanks very much guys really appreciate it and uh to everybody that's that's watched and listened uh, thanks very much and and stay tuned for more sounds good take care thanks i'm guys. good y'all